And the very first MDMA session that I was able to do was, it was like BC 80. There was a before and there was an after. Like it was incredible. These medicines are very much context driven. Um, but that's the way I would say it is, yeah, you could take some of these things in a social environment and it's going to you know, take some energy and take it. But you know, when you're using it inside of a therapeutic environment with a therapist that's just sitting with you and stuff, the, the way that I describe to people is the very first time in my life where I felt like I was descending into this ocean of um, self-love and self-worth, which was not an experience that I had you know, at any point in my life since I was 12 was anything around you know, feelings of, you know, feeling good about yourself even. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Field Tripping. Today, we are talking with Todd Herman. Our conversation touches on Todd's experience with MDMA-assisted therapy to overcome sexual trauma, the power of alter egos, and whether there exists a one true authentic self. But before we get started, here's a reminder to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Towards the end of the episode, we'll go into our how-to segment where listeners can call in and ask a question for me to answer. If you have a question about mental health, psychedelics, or anything we've chatted about, drop us a note at fieldtripping at castmedia.com or leave us a voice recording at speakpipe.com slash fieldtripping. And as always, if you love the show, leave us your thoughts in a review on Apple Podcasts. It's much appreciated and helps us reach new people to help educate them on psychedelics. Your thoughts help a lot. Now, it's time for some news to trip over. A lot of anecdotal information exists around using cannabis and psychedelics together. Many people claim that using cannabis can shorten the come up, extend the trip time, and intensify the experience. This last claim is now supported by a scientific study published in the journal Psychopharmacology. The authors sent out online surveys to people who were planning to use psychedelics with or without cannabis. They found that people who used psychedelics and cannabis together had more intense experiences than people who used psychedelics alone. They also found that while low doses of cannabis seemed to reduce feelings of anxiety during the experience, high doses increased these emotions. Clearly, there's a complex interplay going on between cannabis and psychedelics, and these findings can help guide harm reduction strategies in the future. On to today's conversation. Today, I'm here with Todd Herman, performance advisor to athletes, leaders, and public figures, and award-winning author of his book, The Alter Ego Effect. His programs for developing your mindset and strategy are meant to help you get to your peak performance all on your own. Using a particular alter identity, Todd's alter ego effect gives you the tools and guidance to make change happen fast. It's a fascinating approach and one that is both tested and true and backed by science. Think of Kobe Bryant's Black Mamba or Beyonce's Sasha Fierce. The book has been translated in 11 languages, recently made it into a TV show, and Todd's expertise in getting unstuck has helped so many people around the world and will continue to do so. Todd, thank you for joining us today and welcome to Field Tripping. Thank you, Ronan. I'm excited to be here. It's good to see you, man. I took the opportunity uh, in preparing for this podcast to look back at our interactions and uh, thanks to the magical, wonderful, and mutual friend Jason Gaynard, Gaynard of Mastermind Talks. We've actually been friends on Facebook since January of 2015. I don't know if you're aware of that, but uh, I just found that out. Um, and I'll be honest, I didn't know much about you. Uh, and I don't think we interacted very much until, uh, F at all until mastermind talks in Cabo. And at that mastermind talks, you shared a story that literally left me in tears and further solidified my resolve that we were starting to build something with field trip that was something the world actually needs. If it's okay with you, uh, I'd love for you to share that story as you did in Cabo because people need to hear it, not just because of the role that psychedelics play in it, but also because the real hero in my mind in the story is the vulnerability that you showed and are showing and telling the story. I think the world needs more raw honesty, in my opinion, and I'll be honest right now. I don't know if I could have stood up like you did and tell, told that story, uh, but I'm so incredibly grateful that you did. So please, if you wouldn't mind sharing that story, I think it's really important for people to hear. I'll give people a trigger warning, um, you know, just in case, you know, they've gone through some similar traumas in the past with regards to um, sexual assault or something like that, just to kind of 
I'm going to honor that. To your one statement, though, um, the version of me four years ago couldn't have gotten up and, and said <laughs> and told that story. So it took uh, it took some of the work that you guys are involved in to actually help um, disassociate from the traumas of the past to be able to kind of be in a place where it wasn't so emotionally gripping for me. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, the the story that I was telling the people that were at the event um, was when I was. Um, I was, uh, I grew up on a big farm and ranch in, um, Western Canada, the province of Alberta specifically. And, uh, you know, at the time it was 10,000 acres. Now it's grown to 30,000 acres and I'm a massive extrovert. Uh, and here I was, I was like a fish out of water growing up on a farm and ranch where I wanted to be around as many humans as I possibly could. And so, um, when you're an extrovert and your best friends are cows and horses, um, that's typically <laughs> you, know, you, you want to get to a big city. And then, you know, I ended up moving to New York city years later and, you know, called that, uh, called that place my home. But, um, during the summertime, I would, um, beg and plead with my parents to go to basically any summer camp that I possibly could. And, uh, you know, back in those days, it was church camps typically. So one weekend I would be, uh, Protestant. The next week I'd be Catholic. The next week I'd be Baptist. It didn't matter to me. I just wanted to go and be around other people. Um, and, uh, most of the time it was, it was, it was a blast. It was great times. And then, um, when I was 12, I went to a, a church camp and, um, well, when I was there, I got singled out by, by a man and, um, he, uh, you know, sort of like saying things like, you know, you're, you're special, you're unique, all this kind of stuff. And, he invited me for a, uh, I don't even know what the context was, but it was some sort of like private meeting and, um, uh, him and another gentleman over the course of that evening. And then the next evening as well, um, you know, abused and sexually assaulted me and, um, you know, pretty brutal experience, uh, as well. And, you know, the entire time they had such a formulaic approach to, um, uh, isolating you uh, beating you down, um, you know, giving me commentary in my own head that, you know, I wasn't special or unique. And, you know, if, you know, your family loved you, then they would be here with you right now kind of thing and, and stuff like that. And to a 12 year old, I mean, um, and this world was so foreign. I, I grew up and had two phenomenal parents. Like this stuff was not something that was ever, you know, um, a part of any of our experience, um, in, in our family. And, uh, it was a real, it created a real huge, you know, emotional and psychological divide between me and in my own family. Um, because I never, I never told anybody about it. I kept it private for 30 years. Um, and, uh, through that process of me keeping it private was went through my, basically an entire lifetime of depression throughout that entire, you know, I was, I'm still, I've still been a, a very good high performer, I guess you could say. But um, the way that I tell people is that I I might have achieved a lot of stuff in my life, but I've done it all with the emergency brake on the entire time. So right. it's been you know exhausting and um, challenging and difficult. Battled suicide as well many times, um, and you know it's not the uh, it's, it's not the most comforting place when you're sitting in a, on a hospital bed, choking back charcoal, because you, um, you know, tried to kill yourself with pills and charcoal is the way that you soak up the, um, all of the, the pills that you take up and it's not easy to choke down that stuff. And it makes you question a lot of stuff, but, um, yeah. So I struggled with that for a really long time until I finally ended up having a breaking point and, um, ended up finally getting treatment for it. A number of questions, if you don't mind me asking, and if anything yeah. is ever offside, please please say so. Um, the the separation that started to occur between you and your family, or even truthfully between you and yourself, uh, I'd imagine at twelve, yeah. were you aware of what was going on, um, or did you just kind of did did you realize how wrong that experience was at the time, or was it just kind of like, oh, I guess this is what happens, you know, sometimes did you become aware of like how much it disaffected you from yourself or your family or did it take many years um before you looked back and said Holy. no i i knew it right away like right away um and so to your first question did i know that it was wrong um i did but i also and this is the story of many people that have some sort of you know rape or sexual assault happen to them um 
you know, the perpetrators have a fantastic way of making you feel like it's your fault. Like it's that you had, that you had this coming to you. And so, um, that was, that was some of the battle within is I know that that isn't true, but in some ways it has to be true because this happened to me, right? Like you, it's, it's, it's you reconciling that reality is reality. This thing happened. And, um, and so if, if these adults are telling me that I'm the one who is, you know, a cause of this, then maybe there's some truth in that. Right. But I recognized immediately. I mean, I was just a different human being right off the bat. Um, and that sort of maybe more carefree, um, happy-go-lucky version of myself back then. I was always a kind of a serious kid in that I was always a very focused and I was very competitive as a good athlete. Um, it sort of dialed up a lot more of the darker energy, I think, inside of me. Right. But uh, the one thing that it didn't do, which is the one thing I've always been kind of proud of, was I didn't turn into a um, a victimizer of other people. Like I didn't turn into someone who was um, a jerk. And I could have every excuse in the book to like treat other human beings like they were, you know, trash or something like that. But I never, I never did that. And I, I could probably credit more of my family upbringing to saving me from doing that because I still had a, you know two great parents and great siblings and stuff. But I never felt, I, I just felt like I was different after that. And that it wasn't like, I just, some, there was a lot of times where I just felt like I wasn't a part of the family. And, and were your parents, did your parents see it immediately? Um, or is this something that uh, just kind of operated? No, the only thing that was, that was recognizable was that I did become a bit of a um, troublemaker. Um, you know, like got caught shoplifting in my, you know, teen years and, um, you know, arrested a few times, um, for, you know, different little, not massive things, but, you know, nefarious little teenage stuff that I was doing. It was just my way of acting out, which wouldn't have never been a part of my character before then. And was it something that you kind of buried into your subconscious and tried to forget about, or was it always kind of there? Well, there's like periods of time where, um, I did such a great job of burying it. It's, you know, you know, people who go through this, you develop such phenomenal coping skills. Um, and, uh, and it truly actually is a form of mental toughness for, mm -hmm. for some people. I mean, that's actually my world. I mean, I do mental toughness coaching and peak performance work with some of the most elite athletes on the planet. You mentioned Kobe Bryant, um, or, you know, leaders and CEOs and founders and, um, public figures and people in Hollywood. And it is not an uncommon experience for me to, after working with someone for a long, long time, that they do open up and that some of them had very similar experiences growing up. And not to say that in order for you to become a high performer in life, you have to have some sort of epic trauma happen to you as a kid. Right. But yeah, I had, um, there was periods of my time in my 20s where literally it, it didn't trigger me in any sort of way. And then all of a sudden, some event would come up. And, um, all that old stuff would come flooding back in the challenge that I've had. And, and I'd said this in my, in my talk that you were at was, um, that experience was videotaped and, um, and that videotape is a very popular, apparently videotape in the, um, um, pedophile world. And so I still, to this day, at least once a week, will get trolled by somebody sending me a GIF of, you know, myself as a 12 year old, you know, getting abused and stuff like that. And so that's been the more challenging part of getting past it. Like I can, I can be past the event, but, um, the, uh, the constant sort of trolling assault just doesn't, it just doesn't end. And they always find a way of getting my email address or, you know, I'm, uh, sending me something. So what really comes up for me is you hear people, um, who are survivors of sexual trauma. And by and large, in, in my experience, the people who have suffered it tend to be women. Um, and so there's certainly an empathy that comes up, but also a bit of an alienation of like, I just can't understand really on a, on a deeply personal level what that must have been like. But looking mm -hmm. at you and, and seeing a guy and who in many ways I see a lot of myself in not that i know you too terribly well but you know you're a yeah. guy probably late 30s early 40, 40s pretty successful business minded all that kind of stuff and it, like it strikes me hard like it, it i just 
it, it really resonates with me, not in a good way, I suppose, but like I, I can really empathize on a, on a different level hearing you talk about it. And I think that's really important because I think there are probably a lot more men who experience similar kind of things that we know of. I would certainly say a lot more women experience it overall, but I think there's probably a large audience of men who have experienced similar things. And, you know, it just really changes how real it becomes and, and how close it can actually be. So I, I really thank you and, and applaud you for for sharing and being so candid because I think it really is so important as part of the conversation. Um, and, and the thing, you know, and I know you said four years ago you couldn't do this, but like even just thinking about having to go through something like that and talk about it, like the level of humiliation I feel just thinking about that, let alone having experienced it like it, it really is you know it, 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 it just a, I guess a credit to you for being here and talking about that so so thank you because I'm not sure I could do it yeah well you know like well one thing one of the things that drives people drive drove me I can't say for speak for other people um but the one thing that drove me from never talking about it is exactly what you're talking about is the humiliation side of things um and uh and until someone gets to the other side of recognizing that there is no reason for me to be feeling humiliated by that. Um, and in fact, it's like, it's, it's basically a topic of my next book. Like I've coined a, a term for years with people around the idea that the, the darkest moments of your life are the greatest challenges that you go through. It doesn't have to be traumas even. It can just be like you trying to overcome something really epic for you. Um, and it can be even a career pursuit. Um, is those those difficult times um give you a cape and so i talk about cape abilities you know Hmm. in that there's a dash between cape and then abilities and and that experience for me once i got to the other side of it through the actual help of um uh plant-based medicines and being able to disassociate from it and seeing it for what it also gave me which was an an extraordinary skill set as well um, because I do have an extraordinary high level of empathy and compassion. And um, I have a really hard time going into a mode of hating someone else because knowing my own experience, I know that everyone else, you know, anyone else that's listening to this, um, they've had some things in the past, which I'll never know about it. And so if someone slights me in some ways while I'm shopping in the grocery store, I have a far greater ability to just let it sort of slide off because I don't know what that person's world was like that day. And, you know, I just happened to be in that moment, the person that they might have like lashed out at or bumped into or something like that. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I look at it as the, a lot of these things have given me capabilities and it's the cape that I'm wearing on my back, which I'm now that's accelerating some of the abilities that I'm able to use in helping, you know, other people through the businesses and and the work that I do. So. Um, but humiliation is uh, a horrible and when it trapped me for 30 years for crying out loud. So, um, and then I'm getting on the other side of it. It's just extraordinarily freeing. And the, um, the amount of mental cognitive load that is dumped because my brain isn't sacked with that, um, that trauma anymore is it's, it's, it's actually profound. It's a completely different me. I think you talked about it at Mastermind Talks, but when did you realize that you were carrying this um, and decided to do something about that? Well, I mean, it was always there. Yeah, it was, I was always, always there, carrying yeah. it, and um, but it was uh, February of 2017. Um, we had just had our third uh, kid, Charlie, our little guy, and um, I had two other daughters, Molly, who is who was just about four, and Sophie, who was uh, two and a half at the time. And, um, the Charlie's birth was a really traumatic birth. And I was also going through a, a really bad, uh, breakup with a business partner as well, who was doing some nefarious things behind the scenes. Um, and so there's a lot of <laughs> emotional energy that was being brought to the surface. And because of the way that he was trying to, um, operate illegally, um, it made me feel trapped. And it was the exact same experience that I'd felt 30 years before. And, um, and so I wasn't really managing my emotions very well at the time. And I, uh, was picking up my, my, so my wife is home now 
um, resting with Charlie. And um, I picked up Molly and Sophie at preschool at Chelsea Piers in New York City, uh, a huge sporting complex. That's where they went to uh, preschool as well. And so, you know, hundreds of people are streaming through its largest sports facility in, in New York. And I'm picking up the girls. And I put Sophie into the carriage and then I pick up Molly to put her in the, uh, the top of the upper baby carriage. And, um, and, and as I do, Molly, um, puts her hand to my face and she says, daddy, are you happy? And I said, um, yeah, I'm happy. Why? And she said, uh, oh, because you've been yelling at us a lot lately and it's making us sad. And, uh, I was, I'm here. I am in the middle of this huge facility and I just start tears just start streaming down my face. And my first thought immediately was, um, I'll be damned if I give my kids secondhand trauma. Um, and that's when it started the process. That doesn't mean that I immediately called a therapist and started working with someone, but it started the high level of awareness that I needed to get this thing, um, fixed. And it took a couple of months. And then I ended up getting connected with someone who was, um, extraordinarily respected in New York city. Um, someone who, you know, skilled in childhood trauma stuff. And then that got me into do, doing work inside of, um, you know, plant-based uh, medicine. But that was the moment. And then ironically, uh, let me see, about two years later, um, maybe, no, not even a year and a half later, um, I was tucking in Sophie and Molly and I was snuggling with Molly in bed. And, um, and Molly did the exact same thing. She put her hand to my face and she said, Daddy, I came here for you, didn't I? And I was like, even now, I can just almost cry. Um, uh, I was like, I think you did. And it's not lost on me that Molly's name is the slang term for MDMA as well. Just the irony of all those different things. But uh, yeah, she's just the kind of spirit that came along at the right time, said the right things in the moments that needed, needed, needed them to be said. And that's what spurred everything on. Yeah, you say irony or maybe synchronicity is is more yeah. appropriate term, but totally. Yeah. yeah, as you said that with like Molly touching your face that second time, like I, I felt myself well up, you know. And yeah, I certainly haven't had your experiences, but there was a moment uh, probably a year and a half ago where I lost it on Cohen, my then one and a half year old, for something like he was just being a one year old, but I was under such stress, and like the moment, like I saw him collapse. Um, as a parent, it it's it can't help but change you in a, in a good way. You know, they they teach us as much as we teach them. So, um, can you take us through the experience of of you know looking into therapy? Um, ultimately, I understand you participated in one of the MDMA trials. Can you shed some light on on that experience and how it was done and, and what the experience was? One of the um, most frustrating parts of the therapeutic side is human beings are involved. <laughs> the reason I say that is that um, the hard part of anyone who is going through a difficult time is actually, well, A, admitting to yourself that you need to go get some help. Um, and then B, believing that anyone can help you mm -hmm. is, is another thing. And then when you actually cross the chasm and you start reaching out to people, you realize that unfortunately, and there's, there has to be a business opportunity here for someone, that the world of counseling or therapy or psychology, they do a horrible job of customer service. Um, the number of therapists that, because my wife actually took it on as the, you know, the evangelist and advocate for me. And, um, she would get so frustrated at the number of people that would a never even reach back out, you know. And when you have you have to think about that, the, the customer who's coming to you is in a very vulnerable, vulnerable state. And so, just the act of trying to find someone who can help you is sometimes difficult. And um, and so, um, if I was to encourage anyone to do it differently, is the vulnerability of going to peers and friends that are really you know, trusted for you and get a referral from them is way better than trying to go and do it cold on your own. Yeah. Um, it seems to have worked better. But then once I actually did find um, the, the person who ended up helping me, it was, um, yeah, it was, fant it was just fantastic just to be able to talk to someone and, you know, whether it was no judgment or, and in fact, his, 
approach probably isn't the same approach as most other people's, but he did most of the talking actually. Like he took a lot of the, the weight off of me. He kind of got that something bad happened, didn't need to get into all the details around it. And I appreciated that as well because I probably wasn't ready to you know, share every single minute detail. And when I, when I did the talk that you were at, I talked about the real detail side of things as yeah. well. Um, so that was great. But immediately he recognized that I was someone who was very open to a lot of other maybe methods that could help me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he got me into the, um, the maps Institute MDMA study at Bellevue hospital. It was the third trial phase that they were going through. And what people don't realize is when you're going into some of these studies, they, this particular study, they do this, um, I forget the name of the, the test that they run you through, but it's sort of, um, gauges your level of traumatic experience over the course of your entire life. And they ask you like questions that you wouldn't even think of. Um, and the third trial phase group, they were sort of reserving more from my recollection, people that have had maybe the most extremes of trauma um, and had never had any sort of treatment yet. That was key. Right. Um, they, they had carried it with them. And I think you had to carry it with you for more than 15 years. I think that's what it was. Jeez. So it was a lot of, um, there was a lot of Vietnam veterans that were in there, um, uh, Gulf War veterans, um, Bosnian, um, the Bosnia conflict veterans. There was a lot of military people that were in that one, I think as well. And so I did it. And again, I was not in the best psychological state at the time. Like I was struggling mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> I did the test and the lady who was administering it said, um, will you have the lowest score of someone? And she shouldn't have shared that probably, right. um, because it did not make me feel very good that I'm like worse than failing than other people. And, uh, but it was that just the test alone was actually quite, you know, I wouldn't say traumatic, but it was difficult to take the test. Long story short, once I got into it and the very first MDMA session that I was able to do was, well, it was just, it was, it was like BC 80. It, there was a before and there was an after, like it was incredible. And again, like, you know, this Ronan in, in your world, these medicines are very much context driven. Um, but that's the way I would say it is, yeah, you could take some of these things in a social environment and it's going to you know take some energy and take it. But, mm -hmm. you know, when you're using it inside of a therapeutic environment, you know, in a, you know, room with a therapist, that's just sitting with you and stuff. It was, um, yeah, it was just amazing. It was, you know, it's the, the way that I describe to people is the very first time in my life where I felt like I was descending into this ocean of, um, self-love and self-worth, which was not an experience that I had, you know, at any point in my life since I was 12 was anything around, you know, feelings of, you know, feeling good about yourself even. Wow. What was the actual therapy piece? Like, you know, we talk about a lot of people have experience with psychedelics, usually in yeah. a social setting or whatever the case may be, but not a lot of people have real experience with good, meaningful integration work mm -hmm. or the therapeutic process associated with it. Um, so if you don't mind sharing some color on that as well, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. I mean, one thing I want to make sure I'm careful with, because I do have some, I've had seen some other people who sort of have alluded to it as almost being like this magic pill and like anything, there's work that has to go along with it too. Right. It's just that it accelerates so many things. Um, so for me, I know, uh, the way that they were doing the, 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 the study was there was a group of people. I was in this first group, um, that you literally, you, you took the, the medicine. Um, so you start off with initial dose and then an hour later you have the, you top it off. This is for MDMA You yeah. top it off. And, um, uh, and then it was about five, four and a half to five and a half hours, roughly most, most likely five and a half hours, you know, laying on a, uh, you know, comfortable sofa, eye mask on headphones on as well. Um, playing a specific playlist. Um, and, uh, so I was in a group that the therapist didn't try and do any therapeutic work with you. It was literally just trust the medicine. The medicine will do the work that it needs to go and do. Let's not have any human intervention. And I know that, uh, some other people 
did uh, had therapeutic intervention throughout, uh, where maybe they're getting people to talk about something. And um, and I've and and since then, not even people that were in the study, but other friends that have gone through similar experiences have all felt like most likely the the one where the medicine just did the work on its own was probably one of the more beneficial ones. Mm. Cause again, like even for as much of a professional as we might be as a human being, our own ego and our own, like <laughs> sometimes our own agenda will want to go in or we want to demonstrate our therapeutic skills. Whereas, um, uh, you know, maybe nature has a more efficient pathway, um, to that. Yeah. So that was it. And then right afterwards there were, um, so I, I went and had this session every month for three months. So there's session one, session two, a month later, and then session three with the MDMA, the third month. Um, and in between there was integration. So, um, you know, a lot of journaling for you, what came up afterwards and, and then, um, talk therapy with my, um, my psychotherapist that I was working with. Gotcha. So, and, and I would say like, that's one of the things that I know a lot of people who maybe take some of this stuff at home will, will miss out on is they, they don't work on the integration side of things. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. how important do you feel that the integration ha- had an impact? I would say it's probably, um, to give a percentage, I was going to say 70%, okay. frankly, just, just because of, yeah, you can take these, you can take these medicines and you can get an immediate, like just a euphoric boost. And it lasts maybe a week. I've seen it happen. Like where people are just, they feel like the world changed for them and, you know, things are going to be so much different. And then a week to 10 days later, they've slipped back into old behaviors and old routines because they're, they're, they're waiting for them. Whereas that therapeutic side of things, that ritual that you get into, that routine that you get into with someone else helps to keep that um, road nice and straight and narrow for you. Um, cause you keep on returning back to that experience that you had and, you know, resolving it with, um, with someone else, which I think keeps it even more, keeps the, the neurons more connected to that specific moment. It's like anything, you know, the, the classic phrase of the, the wires or the neurons that fire together, wire together. And so when you have this amazing experience and you can repetitively keep on talking about that amazing experience with someone else. It helps to wire all that stuff into a, you know, a new um, philosophy or a new, you know, um, paradigm for you. I totally agree. A lot of people, I think, pay homage to integration, um, but it still feels energetically. A lot of people think of it as optional. Um, and I think it's just really important that people understand just how impactful it is. Um, and so thank you yeah. for sharing that. You referenced... I think the experience of disassociating from the trauma. And I find that an interesting choice of words because a lot of people talk about healing as opposed to disassociating and, you know, and talking with, uh, I'm sure, you know, Tucker, you know, we talk about ketamine and being a dissociative, it disconnects you from yourself. Um, whereas MDMA is designed or, you know, spoken of as a, as an entheogenic actually reconnects you to yourself. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is it, do you feel like you disassociated from it or do you feel like you healed it and, and let it go? Uh, I'm just curious because the choice of words was interesting. Yeah. So I had an observer experience with mine where, um, well, a, when I, so I did, I've done MDMA and I've done psilocybin. Um, and, uh, the MDMA was extraordinarily helpful in getting rid of the somatic trauma, um, which, even for me, I'm like, I'm, I'm I run a, a peak performance company. I, we, we have a neuro, we have very much a science backed approach to things. We had neuros, two neuroscience researchers on staff since the early 2000s when neuroscience almost wasn't even a thing. Um, cause I was always more fascinated with like, well, why does this work so well? And it's the stuff that isn't in the self-help books. Um, cause I'm, I'm a fairly solid person who or a fairly, fairly solid, um, rock thrower of a lot of the self-help books that are out there because, they're, they're pandered by people who aren't practitioners. They're not the ones who are actually doing the work every single day. Yeah. Like I didn't even realize that somatic trauma was a thing. Like I didn't realize that human beings held trauma in parts of the body. And, and for me, I actually found out that I held it in the top of my shoulders. Um, and some of that was because of 
the actual experience that I was in and the way that I was like held down and stuff like that. And, um, and so MDMA did a phenomenal job of getting rid of that physical, uh, tension, stress and, and stuff that was in my body. But for the event, um, I became an observer of it and I was able to see myself as, you know, the innocent person in that event, as opposed to a guilty party. And, um, and so when I say disassociate, that's what I meant is like, I was, I was not experiencing the same emotions as I was in that moment. So I was just, I was just disassociated from it. And right. then I could just see it for what it was, which was a young kid getting abused by two other people. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, and it wasn't his fault. And so that was, that's kind of the f- framing for me. And, and some of it is also because I do so much work on identity stuff. Like I wrote the book, the alter ego effect and, um, the reason I called it the effect and not the method, even though in the book I talk about there's a method to how you can build out this alter ego and and why it's such a surprising approach to transformation because people wouldn't think that it would be. They're like, wait, I'm already having a hard enough time knowing who I am. Now I got to go build an alter ego for it. And um, and that's sort of the magic of it is you're disassociating from your own identity and you get to step into something else. And it's um, backed by like just so much of even the way that we word things. It's grass is greener on the other side. I look at you and I go, oh, I wish I had Ronan's life because I love the scarf that he wears. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so we do that just naturally. We tell stories about other people. Their lives are easier. And so that's sort of one of the powers of the alter ego is you go, okay, we'll just let reach that then. Like if that's what we're going to do. And then um, it becomes this amazing effect to help you find actually what you're capable of. So I'm constantly talking about disassociation. So some of it is just maybe habit, the yep. use of it. Um, then it is a real specific way of me experiencing the moment it's a, itself. I want to get into the alter ego effect in a minute, but I had one question. Um, you've kind of touched on it, but uh, I wanted to just speak to it directly. I was recently at uh, an event called a long, slow dinner um, with Keith Ferrazzi. I don't know if you know Keith, but yeah. my guess is you've run in the same circles. And at the dinner, there's a woman who was also a survivor of sexual trauma who, after sharing her story uh, in only a way that really I think Keith is good at adducing, um, not to give credit to Keith, but he creates an environment where people are very open to sharing, much like Jason, actually. Um, after she shared her story, she said something that struck me and I think everybody in the room. She said, God bless the man who raped me. Um, because as horrific as the event was, it put her on a path to healing and self-awareness that she probably never would have been on had that event not happened. Um, much like your story, I was blown away by that. And I'm curious to know, have you been able to see that experience in the same way? Yeah. I mean, um, that's why that I use that term capability. Like it did, it gave me a cape and it forged powers or whatever. Um, I don't know if I'm necessarily in the exact same camp all the time as, you know, there's, there's people who will say, you know, Oh, I'd never regret anything in my life. And I'm always like, really, there's things that I I've done that I regret. Yeah. Like, and why, why is, why is that such a bad thing? And so my point about that is after being in the world of, you know, human behavior change and stuff like that for a long time, I, I just, I know that there are some people who are baked to go and, and do something, whether it's good or big with their life. And I don't know if I would have even needed that trauma to go do that. I right. think it gave me, it did give me some skills. Um, and, uh, it definitely gave me some, some superpowers, but I don't know if I wouldn't have built up superpowers in some other way as well. I think right. it's a, I think it's what, what she's saying is, a, is an extremely, um, mature and emotionally resilient and beautiful tone. Um, but I also really hope that my children don't have to go through any of my stuff. I think they can all be really successful human beings without having to go do it as well. So you've had uh, incredible success in your career most recently, I guess with the release of the book, the alter ego effect, which is now a TV show. How's the TV show doing by the way? Is it, is it doing well? Yeah, it's been fun. Um, especially with like younger audiences. So to, to your point, so um, uh, there's a show now on Fox that comes on after the mass singer and it's a singing competition where people are given digital avatars that they can use to go out on stage instead of taking themselves out there. Most of the people have had singing backgrounds, but then stopped because of stage fright or the way that they're fearing the way that they looked 
um, and getting prejudged. And so the digital avatars become the essentially the mask to allow them to go and lead talent first for themselves. And uh, it's even my own kids, like I would have, I wouldn't have suspected it how much they love watching the show. And it's not because it's dad's show. Cause it's not necessarily my show. My, my book inspired it. And I've, you know, been advising behind the scenes with it as well, which has been fun. But um, yeah, that's been, that's been great. Whether or not it gets to have a second season. I don't know. I mean, it, it does, it does pretty well numbers wise, but we'll see. Keep our fingers crossed. Um, and you've got your own shoe line. I su- suppose. I mean, I don't know if it's your own shoe line, but it's pretty, freaking cool certainly the 15 year old self uh, in me was when i saw that i was like damn that is cool i would love to have my own shoe line um so congratulations on on that Thanks. as well how, how are the shoes do you have a pair of the shoes or are you wearing I them do. Around? They're, they're sitting out there i'm uh um and i have a massive crate more of them coming so yeah so brooks running reached out to me earlier this year um the book has been a really popular book inside of you know their you know, corporate culture. And, um, they reached out and said, Hey, we'd love to build out an, uh, a line of alter ego shoes. Um, and, and so it was, f- it's been a fun collaboration. Um, as someone who owns business and you know, this you Ronan, you know, typically you're always spending your own money <laughs> on your marketing. So it's been really fun creatively spending the money of a major brand as well. And, uh, and yeah, so it's been great. They just had a launch party for it in, um, it's starting in Europe first and then it'll be coming over to North America, but it, uh, turned into their biggest, uh, pre-event or pre-launch, uh, shoe order event, um, in any of their shoe lines. That's so cool. Well, if in that crate, you have an extra pair of size nine, sign me up. Uh, I would love to, uh, be able to rock those. Uh, around, I'll, get you, but, I'll get you a pair. Awesome. Um, <laughs> you know, you've touched on it, but if you can just to give a little bit more color to, um, our listeners about it, with the alter ego effect, I mean, you explain how it works, but what is, what is the, the method to create the alter ego effect? So, I mean, where it started as well, just to give people some background. So when I started working in sport, um, like when I started, work, I started working with young teenagers and then, you know, back in 97 and, you know, the practice kept on growing and growing and growing. I, going, I kept on getting better and better. I found better mentors to mentor me as well. And once I started getting around more elite athletes, like the pro level, the Olympic level, this sort of golden thread started revealing itself amongst the most consistent top performers. And they would say things like, you know, I've got this persona that I step into when I compete, or I have this alter ego, or they use all different language secret identity that I have. And, um, I use the exact same thing when I played, uh, football, um, and, you know, continue to leverage my creative imagination. So it was just getting ready for the Athens games uh, in 2003, the games were in 2004, but there was a, a Olympic swimmer on the U S Olympic team that I was working with. And the way that she just worded it, I was like, wait a second, this is an actual thing. Like just all these other clients came together in one spot in my head. And so I started unpacking with all my past clients, current clients, what they were doing to step into this. And I sort of started to formulate this methodology for how, um, how to build one yourself. And, um, and, and the method um, that I unpack inside the book is people need to realize that there is no one you. Like there was no one Ronin. Um, there are many Ronins that live in the context of your world. God help us. <laughs> well, there's the Ronin who does, who's the inquisitive and curious podcast host, yeah. right? Then there's the, the Ronin, the CEO, and there's Ronin, the dad, and there's, right? And, and in all of those different roles that we play, most people just aren't intentional thinking about how do I want to show up in that space? Um, so, the, the first step in this process is always, well, what's the area of your life that you would like to improve in? Or what's the area that's most frustrating you? What are you avoiding? Because some people are, they want to pursue something, but they don't. They want to be a writer. They want to be a, uh, a speaker. They want to launch a business. And, and that might be the best place for you to think about building an alter ego for this identity. So step one is what's the role? What's the area of your life that you'd like to improve? Step two is what is it that is frustrating you, challenging you? What don't you like about the way that you're showing up? So for me, for example, um, because anytime I'm moving into a period of transition, me going from, you know, husband, wife to dad, that moment is a great chance for me to really design who's going to be coming. And so 
um, as a dad, I wanted to think, okay, well, what, what, what might be uh, frustrating me about the way that I could be showing up with my kids. And because I'm a challenger personality type, right? Like I work with really big personalities every single day. Um, and in order for me to crack through some of that hard exterior, I got to be a challenger for some of them, for some of those people. But is that who I am? Or is that just a habitual identity that I'm flexing every single day? Well, that's what it is. That's not really who Todd is. Um, and, and so it'd be very easy for me to carry that same Todd home. And I hear that from people all the time. It's like, man, I have a really hard time turning it off when I get home yeah. or switching it off or something. And I'm like, yeah, because you don't know who you're going into. Who's the next version of you that you're meeting at the door when you walk into the home? And, uh, and so for me, I go to Kanoa, what are the, what are the attributes, the skills that I want to show up with? Just like I'm building a superhero, right? Because when you think about how you construct a superhero, you think about, okay, what are their superpowers? What are their attributes? What are the traits that they have? Well, when I go home, immediately I thought about, because I grew up with this person, I want to be a lot more like Mr. Rogers. Because Mr. Rogers is at the polar opposite end of that challenger type A personality type. So, well, what is it about Mr. Rogers now? Well, he's patient. He's kind. He's thoughtful. He's caring. He's playful. And, um, and then behaviorally, what does he do? Well, anytime he's talking to a kid, he always gets down to their level. So I'm going to mimic those things. He becomes the model in my mind for how I want to show up, which goes to why it's such a powerful effect is that when 75% of your brain is dedicated to the visual cortex, the alter ego is just simply leveraging the fact that most people don't have a clear vision of what it is they want to move into. The alter ego now builds that for you. Now you do know what you want to move towards. And, um, and so my alter ego for being a parent is um, Mr. Rogers and my own dad. So those are my two models in my mind of how I want. So what I just walked through was what, what might be the skills I don't have or attributes I don't have, I'm not showing up with. And the third step was, well, what are those traits? Or who inspires those traits that I want? Yeah. So that's that kind of third step. Um, and then the fourth step is leveraging um, the fact that we have cognitively this uh, phenomenon called um, uh, enclosed cognition. And enclosed cognition is we as human beings, when we put on something that already has meaning and story in our minds, we enclose ourselves in the cognitive traits and abilities of that thing. For example, um, we all, when we see someone wear a white doctor's coat, immediately attach traits and attributes to that person, whether they deserve it or not. Right. right? Yeah. That there. So, cause we, we've been indoctrinated over the course of, you know, uh, a long period of time that doctors are successful. They're smart. They're detailed. They're methodical, all these things. And so, the crazy thing about it is, though, is when you put on the white coat, you actually automatically become more detailed, methodical, and, um, and cautious in your <laughs> approach. So when you're doing activities that demand that skill set, immediately you'll actually improve. The best example I can give is from the Kellogg School of Management. They did this test on this whole idea of controlled cognition, where they brought a bunch of college students into a room and they gave them something called the Stroop test which is uh, an eye test where you have the words of a bunch of colors in front of you, but the color of the word is different than the word itself. Yep. So you've got the word yellow, but it's done in orange and the word blue, but it's done in red. And your, your job is to go through and, um, and state the color and not the word because your, your eyes pick up the word before they pick up the color. And so they brought these kids in and they did this test and um, they were trying to see um, track how many mistakes they made and how fast they could do it in new group comes in this time. They give them a white coat, but they tell them it's a painter's coat, put on the painter's coat, do the test. So they do it. They leave next group comes in individually and they give them the white, same white coat, no different than the painter's coat, except this time they tell them it's a doctor's coat. And then they do the test. Well, what were the results? The people who were wearing the doctor's coat did it in less than half the time and, didn't, and made less than half the mistakes. Hmm. The people who wore the painter's coat, same results as everyone else because painters' coats enclose you in the cognitive traits of creativity and imagination. Yep. So when they gave them another test that was around uh, creativity and you were wearing the painter's coat, not the doctor's coat, you excelled and the doctor's coat people didn't excel at that. So my point about that is step four in the process is get, an, get a totem, 
get an artifact, get a uniform, wear something that helps you to activate the traits and the abilities of whatever that representative alter ego is. I'm totally going out and buying a cardigan again. So when I get home, I can uh, I can adopt Mr. Rogers. Um, that's great. That's so if I can get more people around the world wearing more cardigans, then my life will be have been a success because it's pretty hard to argue with the fact that that man was, you know, a pretty special human being. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I was I was not up to speed at all on that. But as we were speaking, it reminded me that when we were launching this podcast, because I felt so uncomfortable uh, about being a podcaster uh, and not thinking yeah. I'd ever have enough to say, um, or that I would be too monotone or too boring. I used to uh, in visual, in, uh, visualize being Brad Pitt. I would channel my inner Brad Pitt uh, to bring to yeah. the podcast. But now that I've become more comfortable with it, I haven't actually continued that practice. But I think this is incredibly fascinating and, and something. Well, but, or Ronan, another thing that's happened for you, this is always the thing I let end my speeches with or I talk about in the book as well. So Cary Grant, the um, amazing kind of golden era, Hollywood era actor, um, known as being very charismatic, debonair, you know, good looking guy. Um, but he grew up in Bristol, England to a single mom um, and uh, very little means, but he had these aspirations of making it to Hollywood. And he, uh, but he struggled with mental health, like depression, really a lot of his life. And once he got there, he, he actually built this persona that we all know now as Cary Grant. And he said at the end of his career, when he was being interviewed around this sort of persona that he's known for is he said, it's a beautiful quote where he said, I pretended to be somebody I wanted to be until I became that person or he became me. But at some point we met. And when you think about all of our identities, most people just haven't chosen the identity that's going to serve them well. and Um, you know, if there's anything that I can gift people with, it's this amazing method that's been proven out by just tens of thousands of amazing human beings that's allowed them to be more creatively free in how they express themselves. Um, and what it also does is it actually taps into one of the great superpowers of human beings, which is our creative imagination. Um, we stop using it. Um, and the cool thing about this is like I tell people is every single person listening to this podcast right now has already employed this. Because we did it when we were kids, yep. when we didn't actually know who we were yet. Yeah. Because cognitively, you don't even know there is a self until about the age of eight. So you play around with these different ideas as to like, oh, I'm Batman, or I'm this, or I'm a nurse, or I'm a teacher, or I'm my mom and I'm a dad. And you're just playing on these things and you play this role. And that's not weird. And then all of a sudden, when you get older, you're like, oh, I can't do that. That's childish. It's like, <laughs> okay, well, it's pretty hard to argue with clients like Kobe Bryant that reinvented themselves. Yeah. or Beyonce, who used Sasha Fierce, or to pay homage to Martin Luther King. I talk about the story of Martin Luther King in the book and his alter ego that even his best friends didn't even know about, which I'll leave it as a little Easter egg for people to go and find in that book. <laughs> so that's a good sales hook. I like it. Uh, no, that's awesome. I, I'm totally, I, I'm going to I'm gonna go out and buy some Superman pajamas because I remember running around as a kid wearing Superman pajamas with a cape, you know, the capabilities, and, and that's going to be... Um, what I bring back. That's going to be my new thing. Uh, no, I love you've this. Got lucky, you've got a lucky significant other now. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one word to use. Um, do you ever find um, in coaching people with this, like people not being able to good to turn it off and like having mistakes or, you know, do you coach people in your practice about who that identity is and be like, I want to be Kobe Bryant. I want to be a basketball player. That's the identity. And it's like, that, yeah. that's probably not appropriate for me, uh, depending on where I want to go. But how important is the, the cultivation of that alter ego? Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's huge. That's why, I mean, I tell people, I, I wish I could, but I can't sell alter egos off of a shelf. It'd be <laughs> a lot easier, but it's always so nuanced because um I never know who it is that you have an emotional attachment to, right? And that's one of the really important, and I get into it in the book, that's one of the nuances around this is, you know, for me, Mr. Rogers was, I grew up with him. I really loved him as a kid. And so for me, embodying those characteristics is a lot easier. Someone else say, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be Mr. Rogers. You can't do it at the intellectual level. You're first going to identify it possibly at that level. But then you need to reconcile. It's like, no, do I feel the strong attachment to it? 
because you know that's the problem with most people's ideas or even behaviors. It always has to pass through the emotional brain. Right. I mean, that's what the work that you guys do is about unclogging that entire duct system for people so that more of you can show up more freely, unencumbered by a bunch of resistance and trauma and, and things like that. So, um, you know, if to your point, maybe Kobe Bryant isn't, maybe he is, because maybe it's the attributes and the traits of Kobe and how he expressed himself that when you transmute them into your world, it, it does make sense for you. Yeah. So, you know, I'm in the, in the book, I talk about, um, the, to kick off the book, I talk about Bo Jackson, um, arguably one of the greatest athletes to ever walk the planet. Um, cause he's the only two-star athlete in two major American sports, the NFL and uh, major league baseball. Yep. And, um, he struggled with anger issues and emotional issues. Um, and it sounds like as a football player, like, well, that's fine because it's a violent sport, but it caused him to take bad penalties and it caused him to be a little bit uncoachable. And so like he was telling me, he said, I was, you know, battling that obviously a very good athlete. And one night I'm watching this when I was a teenager, I was watching this movie and on the screen comes this absolute, you know, cold, calculating, methodical character um, uh, that's unemotional. And I thought to myself, wait a second, what if I took that out onto the football field? And it was Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th, right? A serial killer. Yeah. But that's not what he was identifying with. What he was identifying with was this guy is unemotional. Yeah. He's just, he's just getting his job done. Why don't I just do the same thing? And so his mission out on the field just changed slightly. Instead of it being destroy everything in my past, in my in my path with emotion, it became destroy everything in my path, dot, 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 with no emotion. And then and then so Jason became the character that he embodied when he was out there, which then allowed his talents to flow through him, unencumbered by his own, you know, anger issues. And then he became that because he's actually an extremely soft spoken guy now. Yeah. Um, super even keel person. If you were to meet him and talk to him, um, he became the person that he wanted to be. Do you ever worry that the alter egos that people adopt are in the pursuit of aspirations um, for things that are kind of unsustainable in terms of validation, like money or sex or power? It's, you know, common refrain of, um, yeah. amongst the most successful, I put that in quotes, that they achieved their dreams only to realize that their success only showed them that happy was not happiness was not to be found in their success. The old adage of careful what you wish for because you just might get it. How much yeah. work do you think a person ought to do before embarking on a path with an alter ego in terms of pointing in the right direction, finding that right North Star? Yeah, so in chapter three, I talk about um, the uh, the the trapped self and then the heroic self and how there's an ordinary world and there's an extraordinary world. Joseph Campbell is one of my heroes. Okay. Um, he's actually a part of one of my, um, one of my, my second alter ego, which was my business alter ego, super Richard. Um, when I was extremely insecure about how young I looked and it was stopping me from making the calls that I needed to make because I was way too worried about what other people were thinking of me. Right. That's a trapped self. That's someone that's placing way too much, attention and energy on what other people are thinking of me. So that's what I call an outside in approach. Yes. If you're pursuing things because of, you know, the, the thought of fame or, or extreme wealth and, and riches, which by the way, those are, I mean, fine, go after those things. And if you discover that they don't work for you and you realize that you were chasing the wrong thing, I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of lamenting that people do. They go, oh, if I had done it differently, I wouldn't have done it. And it's like, yeah, but you're worth $150 million. Like that gives you a lot of freedom to go and make changes. Yeah. And I feel like it's a really um, ignorant and obtuse way of speaking to other people where they try to come back down the mountaintop and say, oh, I'm a sage now and don't do what I did because yeah. the person sitting there is going, yeah, but I'm making, I'm scraping by right now. So to your point though, that's the power of this method that I unpack in the book is you're doing it from an inside out approach. You're doing it because it's what you creatively want to express. I want to bring to those kids patience and kindness. And I want to flex those muscles more because I want to have a broad um, and, a, and a large breadth of traits and abilities that I use all day long. I don't want to just be a hammer, right? And everything looks like a nail to me. There's yeah. a lot of people that do that. And it works in some ways. 
until it doesn't work anymore. Um, and so I would just say, be mindful of the fact of, is your motivator coming from a, a, an outside thing so you can show others and prove to others something? Or is it what you actually want? Like, what do you want? And um, I had a really great mentor who was actually a client who um, I was running a workshop for his big private equity company in New York City. He's a multi-billionaire person. And I was helping his board of directors with establishing an actual identity for the board. And um, because on these boards of directors, as you know, Ronan, there's a lot of people who come in with different agendas. They've got their own egos and it can be a real clash of personalities. So I was walking through this process and uh, they were kind of getting stuck on something. So I said, okay, well, here's another way to go about this. What don't you want? And immediately people started saying things. And um, and so it kind of worked. And afterwards, um, this gentleman, uh, my client was talking. He said, hey, I just wanted to talk to you about the, the don't want thing. He said, so that that worked. But just so you know, the extremely successful human beings that I know the one thing that they are all very gifted at is they know what they want and they articulate it. Right. And it was such a, this is, this happened in 2008 for me. It was such a good lesson because when, when I started thinking about where I find people struggling, I was like, Oh, it's because most people will not admit to themselves what they want. No. What do you want? Because our brains are wired for negativity bias, because our brains are bombarded with a bunch of stuff, making us feel bad that we don't have the new Nike shoes or we don't have Todd's new Brooks alter ego shoes or something like that. I'm not a complete human being until I have that thing or whatever. Um, we, we're, we're very, it's very easy for us to wire towards what we don't want to have happen. But it's a real skill set to start to really embrace of asking yourself and articulating, no, what do I want? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? And to start grooving a different track in the brain and to go back to actually our conversation earlier, it was one of the great freedoms that happened through the use of all the different um, um, therapeutic sessions that I had with the um, MDMA and the psilocybin around it. it I, I, after the session, I would start asking myself more, what do I want? What do I want? Because the most beautiful metaphor I've heard about what these medicines do for your brain is it's like a fresh snowfall on the brain. And now you're left with the ability to groove brand new tracks for yourself. Yep. And that's been my experience 100% with it. So um, yeah, long answer to maybe a simple question. No, but that's a great answer. It's, it's just make sure you know what you want. What do I want? And, uh, and then you go and you creatively express it through you know, the inspiration of an alter ego if you want. Yep. Or don't, I don't care. As long as you know what you want and you go after it, that's all that matters. Yeah, I, I just want to on the record though that I will not be complete until I have a pair of Todd's Alter Ego Brooks shoes. So there you just go. putting yeah. it out there. Yeah. Um, as you should, as you should. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> just everyone listening, you're not complete until. Um, <laughs> two two questions, and and then I'll let you go back to uh, ordinary life. Um, and I'll thank you right now in advance for um, being here. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, with us as well as the alter ego effect. Um, I think it's, it's really powerful and, and very insightful. Um, one question is somewhat esoteric, but it's something I find myself pondering quite a bit. Um, and the second one is, is a little bit easier. First question is, in reading uh, Yuval Noah Harari's book, Homo Deus, he, he brings up the idea of that the whole humanist movement has been built on this idea of the one truth self, the authentic self. And one of the ideas you talk about um, with the alter ego effect, it works because we kind of move past all the stories and traumas and layers that cover us. And as I was reflecting on it, I, I felt like maybe our den identities are just a function of the stories we tell ourselves and the notion of the authentic self is just a great marketing story. Um, yeah. wh where do you land on that personally through all the work you've done? Um, well, I land on the side of um, people not liking my response. where. <laughs> The word authenticity and the word authentic self in their root form, beautiful words. I get the idea behind it, but in the practical application of them and how now they've become a meme as a way of projecting to other people that that's just me being authentic. I have to remember that there are in the world around me, if I met 6 billion people, guess what? There are 6 billion versions of Todd that are out there because everyone's bringing their own perceptions with it. Right. And some of those people are walking away going, I hate that person. Yeah. Maybe I didn't even do anything to them, but they might dislike me in some way because I remind them of someone else. 
So the idea of authenticity and authentic self, I think is a big trap for a lot of people because A, put you under a microscope and how am I going to find the self? There's no self that's there. Mm -hmm. Like I said before, we have many roles that we play. There's many sides of us. I think the more pure version of that is how do you want to be showing up and pursue that? That's real authenticity because I'm not doing it based on what I want you to perceive me as. I'm doing it because it's what I want. Yeah. And when you can also align that with um, it not defying a lot of you know, social norms, like, hey, I want to show up this way and you just have to deal with it. Like that's, that's, again, ego talking. It's not real source truth. It's not creativity coming out of you. And so the way that I look at us is there is no self that's there anyway. What I think is there is a, is a massive barrel of capability, of traits and abilities. And most of us just pluck a few of those out of the barrel and we just project them out into the world all the time. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be like that. I want to try and use all those traits. And if you see me dealing with my kids and you're like, oh, Todd's a lot different with kids than he was in this context. My answer to that hopefully will be, yeah, and it should be that way. Yeah. Because my kids don't need me talking to them like I am going to talk to a fully matured adult who's trying to pursue very difficult things. They need a different level of encouragement and nourishment. So, um, no, I patently disagree with this spiritual, religious truth over the millennia that is there, that there is an authentic self. I just, I'm, I'm my, my answer is always the same, prove it, because I can prove the alternative a million times over with just the way that you live your life. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great answer. Uh, very insightful. Um, and the final question I have for you is, has, has your work with psychedelic continued or is it something that, uh, you know, was episodic and, and kind of in, in your past? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's continuing. Let's just say that. So sure. unfortunately I was one of the first people to get COVID oh, in, no. um, in North America. Yeah. In fact, um, I think the most viral article to date on a patient of COVID is still mine from <laughs> March of 2020. I got it in February, living in New York City. I, I ruptured my Achilles and I went into uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in February and I ended up contracting COVID um, at the very start of the outbreak. Um, and I ended up getting long haul COVID oh, no. um, as well. And so the last 20 months has been dealing with horrible fatigue issues, sometimes not being able to leave bed, um, horrible brain fog stuff. And, um, and even memory loss, um, Mm -hmm. along with it. And I literally just got past it, um, uh, about a month ago. So now that I'm out of it, cause I actually tried to do another, um, session while I was, um, dealing with long haul COVID. And it was almost like the, uh, the medicine itself was battling a cloud. And then there was this moment, I'll never forget it. Where it was just like, Todd, now it's not the right time. I, I, I just can't work. And, um, and so I was like, all right, so I'll have to wait until afterwards, but, um, absolutely. I'll still continue it. Um, but you know, I think I handle it with a little bit more care and attention. I think that it deserves and not as, um, not freewheeling, but I think some people just, they, they don't appreciate what it is there to help them possibly go and do. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I hate using the word sacred because that implies some degree of, sure. of religious or spiritual connotation, which doesn't resonate with all people, but there's a reverence. There's a, a seriousness that's yeah. going to go with it. And uh, I totally respect that. I'm, I'm tar- totally sorry to hear about uh, the long haul COVID. That sucks because for what it's worth, you're sharp as a tack right now and you look great, at least on the small screen image that I see. So uh, I would never would oh, have Oh, this is just a projected avatar. Oh. <laughs> That's all this is. So um, oh, we're on the show. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm, I'm a heaping mess on a couch right now. So. <laughs> Awesome. On that note, uh, Todd, Todd Herman, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for sharing your story. Again, I think it's really important um, to, to tell that story and get it out there and have people hear it and think about it and, and respond accordingly. And thank you for all your work with uh, the alter ego. And thank you for making the time. I really uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Pleasure as always. Thanks, man. I'm sure I've referenced this quotation before. And I apologize for the duplication, but it's a theme that seems to come up often in the conversations on this podcast. 
If you lack the iron and the fuzz to take control of your own life, if you insist on leaving your fate to the gods, then the gods will repay your weakness by having a grin or two at your expense. If nothing else, Todd's strategy through the alter ego effect is to give people a technique to take control of their own lives, at least their own perspectives and internal narratives, where they may not otherwise have any idea how to do so. And I think that's a wonderful thing. What struck me about Todd is that he practices what he preaches and uses his own technique to help him live his own life, one that's been remarkably successful and also one that has experienced more trauma than many of us will ever experience. His story also reminded me of this quote, Mockingbirds are the true artists of the bird kingdom, which is to say, although they're born with a song of their own, an innate riff that happens to be one of the most versatile of all ornithological expressions, mockingbirds aren't content merely to play the hand that is dealt to them. Like all artists, they are out to rearrange reality, innovative, willful, daring, not bound by the rules to which others may blindly adhere. The mockingbird collects snatches of birdsong from his tree and that field and appropriates them, places them in new and unexpected contexts, recreates the world from the world. And I couldn't think of a better description fitting for Todd's life. Hey, Ronan. My question is, how do I get an eat, pray, love kind of vacation, but where I focus on traveling to certain parts of the world to experience a certain psychedelic trip? Do you have any recommendations on where I should go, who to see, so I have a safe experience, and how can I prepare for this kind of holiday? It's been many years since I've seen Eat, Pray, Love, if I've seen it at all, but I think I have seen it. And turning that into an answer around psychedelics is not one that's not easy, but I think the primary consideration, if you're considering traveling anywhere to have a psychedelic experience, is know the laws and the location that you're going to first, uh, because you definitely don't want to find yourself in a country that you don't know uh, and potentially in jeopardy with the law, certainly. Certain countries have a more well-known openness or legality around psychedelics. Costa Rica seems to be a, a jurisdiction in which uh, psychedelics, it used, at least used in spiritual context, is permitted. Jamaica the laws are pretty clear that psychedelics are not illegal. And, and there's some other jurisdictions around uh, as well that fit similar criteria. So it's really important that you understand the law uh, in that jurisdiction because the worst thing I think you'd want to find is yourself in jail in a uh, country that you don't know the legal system and, and you don't have any connections or context. The other big consideration is make sure you know the destination that you're going to. And it's not easy offhand to ensure the safety and reputability of any particular retreat operator. So I'd suggest that you get in touch with them and speak to them and understand the quality of the service and what integration work they do and what preparation work they do and speak to other people who have been to those retreats. Well, most retreat operators, I think, are quite legitimate and genuinely interested in providing a really wonderful, powerful, transformative, and safe experience. Not all are, and it's not easy to figure out which one's which, but I think if you do your research, trust your gut instinct, and talk to people, you'll position yourself to have a, as great experience as possible, uh, as safely as possible. And those are the two biggest piece of, pieces of advice I can offer in terms of potentially traveling to have a psychedelic experience. One other important consideration is that when you come home, don't forget to continue to do the integration work. A lot of people have transformative experiences when they're on vacation because it is the nature of vacation that you're away and you're living in a different context and different world where the normal factors of reality don't necessarily apply. So people think they can have really transformative experiences and everything has changed. But when they come back home, the stark reality of returning to quote unquote normal can be quite harsh. That's not to say that you haven't had benefit from your experience. You almost certainly have, but it just reiterates the importance of doing the ongoing integration work to take those lessons, to take those insights and really turn them into powerful transformations in your actual life. Thank you for listening to Field Tripping, a podcast that's dedicated to exploring psychedelic experiences and their ability to affect our lives. I'm your host, Ronan Levy. Until next time, stay curious, breathe properly, 
And remember, every day is a field trip if you let it be one. Field Tripping is created by Ronan Levy. Our producers are Conrad Page and Harley Roman. And associate producers are Sharon Bella, Alex Sherman, Macy Baker, and Tyler Newbold. Special thanks to Cast Media, and of course, many thanks to Todd Herman for joining us today. To check out more, visit toddherman.me and learn more about his book, The Alter Ego Effect, at alteregoeffect.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Click the subscribe button to my left to never miss a release, and click here to check out past episodes. See you next week.